Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is your first time with us. We get a, new, a lot of new people in uh, in the summer, and so we're very happy that you're with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we just really love uh, meeting new people, and there's a lot of new families here that I'm getting to meet and I'm very excited about. Uh, just so you know, I am also one of the pastors here. I'm not the lead pastor. That's Steve Davis. He'll be back in a few weeks. He's on vacation right now. So if you don't like the message, just wait a few weeks and you'll get someone new, okay? So... I uh, also, I just want to share with you one quick thing. Uh, one of the ways that we give is through our, uh, the backpack brigade thing that we have going on. And so today is the last day. And Kat is right here on the front row. If you've got any questions about that, uh, she shared with me another need that uh, could be uh, given some attention to that she just found out about. So if you want some information about that, uh, please talk to her uh, and she can get you all that information. Okay. So, and there's a table right back there at the end of the service that we'd love for you to visit. So what I've been doing is we're going through a series uh, called Jesus Interrupted. And one of the things that I discussed last week is the fact that Jesus seemed to be interrupted all the time. It was just a, it was a trademark of his ministry. And it was really just inescapable. Uh, rarely do you see it say, and Jesus planned to do this that day, and that's exactly what happened. There was always... The phrase I find is, and while Jesus was still whatever, and then somebody would come in. And it happens so often that there were interruptions inside the interruptions. And what I want to do today is, last week we talked about how interruptions really are a part of every ministry. If we're just going to serve people, there's going to be those times where, where service, there's, you know, in an interruption, service can really be done if we're paying attention to that. And as I was talking to people afterwards, you know, we were kind of talking about trying to decide between what's a interruption that could lead to service and what's a distraction. And so what we're going to talk about today is the fact that we do have these distractions where we're kind of pulled in two directions, okay? And this is everybody. We all have these different directions that are kind of pulling at us, either externally or internally, that happen all the time. Like for me personally, I was 20 years old when God called me to the ministry. He called me to be a pastor and to work in the local church and to not just do all the, the teaching type things, but also to really reach out to people and to help those in need. And it's something that I'm very grateful for, and it's an honor to do that. However, there's also a part of me that really likes messing with people. Do you know what I mean? Uh, okay, got a big fan in the back. I just, you know how, uh, you know how sometimes there's this opportunity to just kind of mess with someone's head, and you just can't let it go. I let me just kind of tell you, I. I do this a little too much, not all the time, but with certain people. If I'm messing with you, it's because I love you very, very much, or I know that we will never see each other ever again, <laughs> with a wide gap in between. And it's just one of these things I can't help myself. And like once I was at, uh, I was at a fast food restaurant, and I got just something small to eat. And the little girl behind the counter, she rings it up, and it's $6.66. 666. And she just kind of looks at me as if I had just grown horns and a tail and was holding a pitchfork. Now I ask, what would you have done in that situation? I said, you know what? That happens to me everywhere I go. The look on her face was epic. I just, she's crying, I'm laughing, good times were had. Uh, I just, I can't help but every, you know, I just, there's this, there's this mischievous side of me, and I get pulled in all of these directions, and sometimes it's a real Sophie's choice, if you know what I mean. And so, one of the things that uh, I find is that everybody has these different things pulling at them, and we're going to look at uh, a man who had 
two things, two voices, if you will, two directions. These, these, these two things that were, that were just kind of pulling at him. And he had to make a decision about which one he was going to give in to. Uh, for those of you that picked up a bulletin on the way in, uh, just kind of uh, give you a, a look at behind the scenes. I was working on a sermon, and it just wasn't, it didn't feel right, uh, for just lack of a better explanation. And after talking to the staff a little bit, it just wasn't going in the right direction. And so I honestly started over. And so if you look inside the bulletin, there's one that's in the bulletin itself that's printed. That's the old one, because uh, I didn't get, to, get it to uh, the administrator in time. So the one that's just by itself, those are the, today's notes. And also, if you look on here, you'll see that uh, we have it online, and that has been updated. So what I want to do is we're going to take a look at Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. And if you've ever gone to Sunday school, you're familiar with the story of the rich young ruler, okay? And how basically he approaches Jesus and asks how to become saved. And so I want to walk through this passage a little bit, give you a little bit of a background, some context, and then we're just going to pull a few points from that. Because we all deal with those distractions that can pull us away from the things of God. Okay, and so I'm hoping to identify some of those and then come up with some solutions as well. So, Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17, it says this. As Jesus started on his way, so here we go, he was on his way. And this has real significance because he's getting closer and closer to the cross, where he will die for the sins of mankind and be raised again. All right? A man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher. We see here that the man is, he's genuine. He really wants to know the answer to this question. He isn't delusional about it. Uh, he ran up to Jesus, which was kind of a, a, kind of a social faux pas. It's kind of like yawning without covering your mouth. It's something that you didn't do very often. And he falls to his knees, showing penitence, and then says, good teacher, which was an odd thing to say. This was a term that you didn't use. You would call somebody a teacher, but you didn't call them a good teacher for fear of blaspheming God. And so he calls him that. And Jesus' reply is rather odd. He asked, well, first he asks this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he genuinely wants to know. No one else has asked him this question. No one else has asked him this. So he's really, I mean, he's digging deep into something that's really important. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. The, the reason for Jesus' response, we're not entirely clear, but we do know that he wanted to point away from himself and to God. It could be because he knew that he had to rely on God, that God the Father was his authority, uh, and also he was the ultimate giver of grace. It comes through Christ, but it comes from God. And so there's a couple of reasons why he may have been pointing away from himself, but to the Father, uh, some people. But in either case, he wanted to point away from him and to God. And he says, you know the commandments. This is Jesus still speaking. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And so he lays out half of the Ten Commandments. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, some people think that he's just being arrogant, but probably not. He probably tried the best. No one is perfect, and everybody knows this. But he was just kind of communicating, you know, I've tried to live by those laws to the best of my ability. And so he really is a genuine believer. He isn't just putting on airs. He's not being a hypocrite. He really has done these things. Jesus looked at him and loved him. This word looked at is, it means to kind of, to scrutinize. Like you're looking at a chessboard. To really kind of hone in on. And Jesus sees his genuineness as well. And there's, there's a love for him. Because he knows he's trying to do his best. He's, he's doing something good. And he's He's come across this, this knowledge that is, is very important, and rightly so. One thing you lack, Jesus says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. One of the things that uh, some people will do is they'll take this and see it as a denouncement of all riches. That's not true. There were people that followed Jesus who were rich. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea will actually assist him uh, after he dies uh, and comes back to life. Um, the, and there were people that kind of were funding Jesus' ministry. So this was something that was just for this guy. There was, a, there was something in his life that was a sticking point. And Jesus saw it and knew that it was going to continue to be a sticking point until he did something about it. Jesus doesn't ask everyone to give away everything all the time. Otherwise, we'd just be constantly handing each other large stacks of bills all the time. Uh, but do, God does say to give what he personally asks you to give. But that's another sermon for another time. There it goes. All right. So, uh oh. I'm going to get there, I promise. One thing you lack. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And so, this thing. That was the second point, was his, was his money. It was the source of, of many things, as it is for many of us, of, of, of a type of security. Being able to take care of yourself and showing others that you can take care of yourself. But Jesus knew it was a sticking point. Jesus looked around. And again, this is another kind of a, a scrutinizing it's a slightly different phrase, but it's kind of a, kind of a survey of the situation, kind of a, a commanding look of what's going on. And with this, he's doing this with his disciples. He's looking out and seeing, are you going to follow in the same direction? Are you going to allow what culture says to taint what you believe, or are you going to listen to what I say? Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed. This amazed means just overwhelmingly, not just shocked, but appalled. Are you, what? Are you serious? I mean, they just can't, they can barely comprehend it. They were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Just a... Just a phrase, just a, a, a metaphor. Then for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And disciples were even more amazed. So they just can't, the more he talks, the more they can't believe it. It just, it, it just completely goes against everything that they've been told. And they are amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? If this guy... Because it was a very popular belief back then that if you were wealthy, well, then God has certainly blessed you. You know, this guy is a, is a ruler. He has a, he has a, he has a place of authority. If I had a daughter, I would want her to marry this guy. And this person who seems to have everything together, if he can't be saved, then we're all in a lot of trouble. And they didn't realize some of the things that were going on inwardly with this man. Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And we'll dig into exactly what he meant by that in a moment. Then Peter spoke up. Peter. The, uh, this is one of my favorite words. This is my favorite. And then Peter. I don't know what it was. He decided at some point that he was going to be the spokesman for everyone on the planet. Just, you know, everybody everywhere, I'll just, I'll tell you what they're thinking. Uh, it's kind of like, have you ever met that married couple? Maybe they're a little bit older. And at some point, uh, the wife becomes the spokesman for both of them. Like he never talks. Hey, man, how old are you? He's 59. The, uh, it's like, I didn't, wasn't, so anyway, that was an aside. So then Peter spoke up. We have left, and this is true, we have left everything for you. And they did, remember? And they left their nets 
and their boats and their fishing stuff, got up and followed him. He left his tax table. He got up and followed Jesus. They all left their stuff, their, their, their livelihood, what was familiar, everything. And Peter has no problem pointing this out. Ah, maybe there's an extra. Oh, there's just an extra. Okay, there we go. Yay. So the, uh, I don't know what happened just then. All right, let's pretend that didn't happen. Uh, Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel We're having trouble. All right. And the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. What he's saying is, I don't know if I got all the verses there. So basically he's saying those things that you've given up will be multiplied. Uh, especially because he says, and you will have more mothers, brothers, fathers, sisters, meaning the community of believers. And you will be rewarded both in this age and the next meaning your life here and on the other side of heaven okay and he also mentions and i want to point this out in the middle of it he says you will receive blessings by giving these things up but you will also receive persecutions okay and then he kind of ends with a proverb he says in the age to come of eternal life, but many who are first will be last. Those people that we look up to and we think they've got it all together, don't. And those who are last will be first, meaning it doesn't look like that God has given them a single blessing in their entire lives. And yet they have done more for the kingdom of God than you could possibly imagine. So, taking a look at this passage, what I want us to realize is there's a few things that we can be distracted by. And one of the things that we can be distracted by, and we see this, of course, in the rich young ruler, is we can be distracted by our idols. For this young man, it was his wealth. And it could be so many other different things. Um, but wealth and the, the, the feeling of security that comes with it, the feeling of stability is something that can really lead us to become self-sufficient and think that we're just, we've got things covered on our own. And because of that, it can pull us away from being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. So in verse 21, towards the end, he tells the rich young ruler, one thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And then the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. One of the things that people don't realize is that with blessings come certain obligations. I'll leave that with every blessing. And of course, the bigger the blessing, the truer this becomes. With every blessing comes complications, temptations, and responsibilities. And that first one, that temptation, the biggest temptation of all, depending on the size of that blessing, is we will take it and we will put it above everything else, including God. We'll make it the first priority. And everything else must bow to it. And when it comes to wealth, I have personally seen this unfold. It was absolute, it was just soul crushing. I'm talking to a man. Uh, we're at just someone's house and we're just kind of hanging out. And what happened is his father had won the lottery. And if I'm counting and remembering correctly, I think he had three sons, uh, a, like a big lottery winnings. I don't know how big, but it was a lot. 
uh, enough to give each of his three sons several million dollars. Just here you go, here you go, here you go. And he was still in that stage of surreal where he had just gotten this giant stack of money. He's still looking at his bank statement. And there's a number on that statement followed by six zeros. And he just, he just can't believe it. And I said, and I've never talked to this guy before ever. And I said, listen, I know we've, I know we've never met, but I just, congratulations. And secondly, please, please be careful. He said, oh, I've hired a financial person to talk to and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, that's not, that is not what I mean. And you could kind of see the life change over the next two years or so. Uh, we hung out several more times. I went to his house. He'd bought, he had bought a dozen cars, all of them fancy. You know, it wasn't like a Kia Sorento. It was like a real, you know, hey, you know, this, this car right here, this is a 1958 Ooga Booga something fancy. I can't remember what he said. Isn't that cool? I was like, yeah, man, you know. I got a Toyota. I'm like, you know, I mean, you saw it. I just drove up in it just right over there. The, uh, it's like, all right. And so just, you know, all these cars. And his father, the one that had won the lottery, somewhere in his mid-70s, uh, got himself a 19-year-old girlfriend. I think I speak on everyone's behalf when I just throw up in my mouth a little bit. Um, and the, the guy that I knew... He eventually leaves his wife, leaves his daughter, because uh, he wanted to kind of chase this lifestyle that his father was enjoying. And it just, I just, over the course of a couple years, I just saw it go downhill as this became the focus. And it was just absolutely soul-crushing. This woman that he left, I just, one of the sweetest, kindest human beings I'd ever met. Daughter was like 11, 12, and that time of, of just that crucial time of life. And he just like checked out to follow his own desires. I've heard it said that if you really want to test a person's character, do not give them troubles, give them success. Give them blessings. And there are so many things that we just kind of, we kind of latch on to, and they become our idol. They're not necessarily bad. Money isn't bad. It's when you make it a priority that it becomes bad. And so one of the things that you kind of have to ask yourself is there, there are ways that we look for, there are ways that we look for attention. There are, there are ways that we try to polish our image. We've all got a little bit of Lady Gaga in us, Okay. I'm serious. The, uh, we've all got these things that we think this will fix all my problems. And you don't have to have millions of dollars to have an obsession with money. It's all about your priorities. And making sure, because there are things that will slowly crawl up the ladder of your priorities if you're not careful. And every now and again, we just kind of have to stop and do an assessment. And just making sure that there's nothing that is trying to edge God out of that first place. And I know that, you know, last week we're talking about interruptions and, and serving others. And this is more about discipleship and following Christ. But those two are, are one and the same. To be a follower of Christ means to serve others on different levels, in different ways. Uh, some people full-time, some people, what they can, you know, there's all kinds of ways to do that, but there is a level to which we are all called to help others. And whether it's helping others or being a disciple, if we're not putting God first, we're going to, we're going to just get pulled in a trajectory, slowly, in a direction that we don't want to go. Another distraction that we can have is we are distracted by our self-reliance. 
We are distracted by our self-reliance. In verses 26 and 27, it says that the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And Jesus lived this out himself. Remember, there's a point where he kind of deflects the attention away from him and to God. And that's because he said, I can only do what God tells me to do. And in John 5, 19, it says that the son, this is Jesus speaking, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. And so he wasn't even fully reliant. He was reliant on his authority, God the Father. And he lived out that life as an example to his disciples and to us today. The, there's a book, and I mentioned it last week, called The Insanity of God. And let me tell you, it is messing with my head. The level of reliance that people who are being persecuted, I mean really persecuted, I mean the government is putting them in jail, I mean that they are having their livelihood and their families destroyed, the, the amount of reliance that they place on God is something that is mind-boggling, and we can barely comprehend it because we have not gone through it. We talk about people, you know, and, and yet we have our own little, we have our little baby persecutions going on here. Um, one thing, I don't know if, I, I know you've seen this. If you're watching a movie or a TV show and there's a pastor in it, guaranteed, 99 times out of 100, he's a creep, he's narrow-minded, he's a pedophile, he's sleeping with his secretary, he's embezzling money, he's doing something wrong. Every single time. Uh, if I'm watching a whodunit, like Law and Order or just a, a mystery movie, and there's a pastor in the cast, I'm just like, no, there he is. There's the guy. Just, just arrest him. That's the guy that did it. He's always the guilty one. Every single time. But that's, you know, that's nothing compared to having an entire government trying to squash your freedoms and putting you in jail because of your belief. And Jesus told them that that was something that they were going to go through. And it is something that we really just, we don't quite understand. There have been many times in history where prosperity has hurt the church, but persecution never has. There's a, there's a, in the book that, um, that I was reading, there was a one, one of the things that they would do in Russia is that they would take the father, put him in jail for years, and then they would just kind of come at some point, and they would just tell the mom and however many kids that she had, you've got an hour to pack some things into a suitcase, and then they would just kind of take them all and just relocate them somewhere, sometimes in the middle of nowhere. And... She's trying to reassure her kids that God is going to take care of us. And as they are dropped off, this guy is picking them up, taking them to where they need to go. And as they get to where their new house is, or their new place to live anyway, the guy turns to them and says, last night God told me that you would be on this bus. He told me to get all the extra food that we had gathered from the church. And here it is. This will last you six months. And when that's up, we'll give you more. And there are stories that they share that are so outrageous, we can barely, we just like, is that true? Read about a, an underground church where because of, you know, spies and people trying to figure out what was going on inside the church, they would never announce where they were going to meet next. They always met in a different location every single week. But they would never announce where it was. They would just say, go to God, pray, and he'll tell you where it is. And then they would all meet at that next location next week. And we just don't get 
the level of reliance that we have to have on God because we haven't been forced to. So many times in American church, um, they'll be speaking to uh, missionaries or somebody just working in another place, and they'll ask them, so what do you need from us? And the missionary, especially if they're being persecuted, will say, what we need more than anything is your prayers. And they will always say, yeah, of course, we'll pray for you, but really, what do you need? And it is such a telltale sign of how we just don't really get what reliance on God really is. And the reason I share that with you is that I don't know what next step God may be calling you towards. But understand that God isn't going to leave you on your own in that. When it comes to our reliance on God, we're, we're, for many of us, we're kind of in our baby steps. But God knows where you are, and he meets you there. And I want you to know that whatever it is, it may be some kind of spiritual discipline. It may be talking to your neighbor. It, may be, it could be so many different things. There, but there's something that is others-oriented, uh, or it is God-centered that he's going to be calling you to. And just know that he is with you in it. If you thought that was heavy, you're going to really hate this next one. Here it comes. We can be distracted by our and others' comfort. Not just our comfort, but the comfort of others. Remember, the, he says in Mark 10, 29, along with all these blessings will take place, but there will also be persecutions. And then in verse 22, saying to the, talking about the rich young ruler, he says, he went away sad. And here's the incredible thing. Jesus doesn't amend the proposition. He doesn't change the offer. He doesn't chase after and go, wait, 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 wait maybe, maybe we can talk about it. Jesus had more people, infinitely more people, walk away from him than follow him. And he never changed the level of commitment. Ever. He says, here's what you need to do personally. Here's what everyone needs to do. Here's your sticking point, but then you need to follow me. And that is what he offers every single person. Very often, we seek through, through other means, and I've talked about this a couple times, how we seek uh, our own significance or security and our satisfaction in almost anything except God. And we are constantly trying to pursue these things. And I, I think it's very interesting how, like I said, that book that I've been reading has really been messing me up. And I just can't help but think about how, you know, when you look at these, these places where, where people are being persecuted, they don't have phrases like self-care. Or spa day. You know, they are really dealing with some very heavy things. Another, another point in that book, uh, the man who wrote the book travels to China because he knows that there's an underground church there and he wants to talk to them about it. And he wants to talk to them about, about persecution because uh, he had spent 15 years in Somalia. It hadn't gone exactly the way he would like. And he made some difference there, but, but he was really struggling with some things. And he was talking to them, and he realized that he, by coming to their home in China, had put them into a little bit of danger. Because they were constantly, you know, they, they, they took a, a car, you know, several blocks from their house. You know, they're, they're doing this serpentine walk through alleys and back ways and constantly checking to make sure that nobody is following them. And then they go inside, and he said, have I put, you know, I know that, I, I mean, I know that you're under persecution, but have I gotten you in trouble? You know, do you think you were followed? And they said, no, I don't, we don't think so. You know, we're just, we're very careful. We try to, you know, make sure that everything is going all right. And here's the thing. 
even if we did get caught, we'd go to jail for like three years. Three years? And they were just, and they were just like, yeah, that's, you know, that's chump change. That's nothing. We had a, a, a pastor from India. Uh, he was born there, and he was just trying to spread the gospel there in his own country. And he visited here for a while, and I had the opportunity to speak to him many, many times. Because I find this attitude everywhere. And in this conversation about how he had gotten beaten up by a bunch of people in this village that he was trying to share the gospel in. And we're like, well, how often does that happen? And he goes, oh, it happens like, I don't know, once, maybe twice a year. It's not that big. What? And it's just, it's absolutely overwhelming. I hear people talk about how they were put in prison for their faith and how it was the greatest experience of their life. That was your greatest experience? Have you ever tried cake? <laughs> what are you talking about? And it just absolutely goes above our heads. And we just can't. And it's so absolutely a part of their everyday life. At one point, this guy asks, and he says, why aren't you writing down these stories and telling people what's going on about the persecution and letting people know about it? And he kind of took him, and he took him to a window. And he had him look out the window, and he said, do you see... Do you see kind of the sunset that's going on? And he said, well, yeah. He says, have you ever told your children about the sunset? It's like, well, no, they, they see it every day. And he said, yeah, that's us and persecution. We see it every day. It's, it's, it's a part of everyday life. It's mundane. And just as I was speaking about how God is going to call you to something... And he will not leave you there. There's a very good chance that he's going to call you into something that is a little uncomfortable. It's going to pull you a little bit out of your comfort zone. Something that maybe you haven't tried before. And it may be rather difficult. But God is constantly, he meets us where we, he meets us where we are. But he loves us too much to leave us there. I want to share this, uh, this quote with you. It says this. The call to follow Jesus does not constitute an additional obligation in life. Very often we look at Jesus like he's a multivitamin. I'll just take that, it'll have some benefits, right? And it'll just be kind of this extra thing that I add into my life. But that's not what being a follower of Christ is. The call to follow Jesus does not constitute an additional obligation in life, but rather judges, replaces, and subordinates all obligations and allegiances to the one who says, follow me. It stands over all of these things that we have going on. And it helps get your house in order, if you allow it. A phrase that we used to throw around here quite a bit, and I think we need to bring back, is that if you bring God into your life, uh, he's going to rearrange some furniture. And he's going to say, we need to go into the garage. No, 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 don't go in the garage. It's a mess in there. It's, oh, I've, just, I've stuck everything in there. I, I can't, please don't go, it's, it's a mess, there's cobwebs, it scares me, I'm embarrassed by it, please don't go in the garage. No, we need to go into the garage. And he's going to find that place of comfort, he's going to find that place of self-reliance, and he's going to start to poke at it. And I talk about, you know, these things that are going on in, in countries where there's persecution, but God is... There's something, there's a next step, and for every single one of us, it's something different. It's not about, I, I don't get to pick the room 
that God is going to go into and rearrange the furniture. I don't pick it. Steve doesn't pick it. No one picks it. God picks it. And you may be kind of surprised by which room it is. But he's the one that we are following. We're not following a church or a pastor, but God. Period. In closing, I want to share with you a couple things. First of all, uh, we have our, our blue bags. I don't have one with me, but there's, you can't miss them. They're underneath a, a blue sign right over there. There's some there, some on that wall there, uh, each corner of the stage. And if you pick this up, somebody will come alongside you and explain in very simple terms what it means to be a follower of Christ. And they'll help you find a small next step. We're not going to put you in a shipping container and send you to Zimbabwe. We're going to help you just do something small. As you begin that new life with Christ, and this may be something you've been thinking about for a long time, and maybe even putting off, but you realize that this is important because it's not just a thing to make me have these religious warm feelings, but it is a, it's a purpose. It's a lifestyle. It's doing something greater than myself. Another thing that I want to tell you about is uh, it's called our orientation chat. And it's a way for you to kind of understand how we do things at Spout Springs. But more importantly, it's a way for you to kind of look into how maybe God has designed you and then a way that you can serve in the church. Uh, as we are starting to, to exit out of the summer months, uh, we really encourage you to step up, find a place that you can serve. Uh, we know that we live in a community where people come in and they go back out. And we want to help you do those things that don't just help here, but will help wherever God may send you in the future. But what is it that God is calling you to do? Not the guy next to you. Not some author in a book. Not some pastor. What is God calling you to do? What is that next step? Are you willing to be obedient? And allow him to take you where he knows you will be able to live out your best life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you do love us. That you look at us intently and you see our desires, you see our flaws, you see our distractions, you see where we've messed up. And you love us. Father, you want so much to show us this life that doesn't depend on shallow, shiny things, but a life, Father, that flows value into the eternal, where we are helping, helping just these eternal souls, Father, that you love and want to see the best for. Father, what would you have us do? I ask that everyone here would just take a moment to just speak to you and ask, Father, what would you have me do next? And Father, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.